Manhunt 2 is so violent, it's been banned in Britain. In fact, you may not want your kids to see the preview of this game. In this case, you're acting out violent killings. Well, players are required to act out murder, stabbings, even torture and strangulation, all with this little thing. So you kind of have to imagine, of course, the impact here. I think that's really art when you're ripping people's heads off and blood is spewing everywhere. Is that really art? Rock and roll. If you want to taste the real hardcore, enter the dungeon. stabbing kittens in the face with pencils. Why? I've played the original Manhunt so many times. I don't know what it is about that game, but I just keep coming back. I suppose it's the excellent, bare-bones stealth gameplay set inside of this relentlessly bleak, hopeless world filled with despicable characters, even the one that you play as. If you watched my review of the game, you can probably tell that I'm a huge fan. There's something about dipping into Carcer City every few years that just does it for me. But I've only played Manhunt 2 once. One single playthrough, 16 years ago. I used to read gaming magazines until they practically fell apart in my hands, and I remember well reading the articles for Manhunt 2. Being such a big fan of the original, I couldn't wait. I can recall when Suda51 said that his latest game at the time, No More Heroes, would be quote, as violent or even more violent than Manhunt 2, unquote. Then the controversy started. There was buzz surrounding the game that, unfortunately, spun out of the camp of interested fans and into the sights of various politicians around the world, as well as worms like certain disbarred, disgraced, former lawyers who took on Manhunt 2 as yet another one of their attempts to use knowledge of the legal system to extort a company, a desperate, sordid practice. In June of 2007, one month before Manhunt 2 was supposed to be in our hands, both the British Board of Film Classification, the BBFC, and the Irish Film Classification Office, the IFCO, rejected Manhunt 2 for rating, rendering the game dead in the water for my brothers and sisters across the pond. That same day, the Entertainment Software Ratings Board, the ESRB, struck Manhunt 2 with the dreaded adults-only rating. Sony, Microsoft, and Nintendo refuse to allow AO games on their consoles. Major retailers don't carry AO games. So, in the span of a single day, Manhunt 2 was, ironically, executed. Rockstar acquiesced to the ESRB and the BBFC heavily censoring Manhunt 2 prior to submission for re-rating. 
most notably with a hideous filter that almost completely obscures the animations during executions, as well as removing civilian NPCs and the end-of-level rating system, thought to reward greater violence with higher scores, as was the case in the first game. The ESRB agreed to rate Manhunt 2 M for Mature, and the game was released Halloween Day 2007, a decision that still didn't satisfy some. A group of US senators, a trustworthy bunch by any measure, penned a letter to the ESRB asking that they consider re-rating Manhunt 2 as adults only. The sentiment was echoed by California State Senator Leland Yee, who stated, quote, The ESRB and Rockstar should end this game of secrecy by unveiling what content has been changed to grant the new rating. Unfortunately, history shows that we must be quite skeptical of these two entities." Unquote. Unfortunately, history also shows that a certain former California state senator pleaded guilty to felony racketeering charges for money laundering, political corruption, arms trafficking, and bribery. More specifically, purchasing automatic weapons and shoulder-fired missile launchers from the Moro Islamic Liberation Front and selling them to an undercover FBI agent. <sighs> Running guns in the morning, banning video games by dinner time. A game of secrecy indeed. <laughs> <laughs> I buy honey and I kiss it on the lips. All right, let's shed all the nonsense and talk about the actual game. I think it was the political mess and the censorship that dampened my enthusiasm for Manhunt 2 upon release. When I played it, I remember feeling like I was reading a book with several pages torn out. I just couldn't get completely into it, and thus I finished it and almost completely forgot it. So going back 16 years later and finally playing it again, my expectations were low, but admittedly I was really excited to give it a second chance, especially playing it how it was intended. One thing I do remember is figuring out the big twist of the story pretty quickly. It's not because I'm super smart or anything, it's just very obvious. The player assumes the role of Daniel Lamb, initially shown as an escaped mental patient with amnesia, trying to retrace his steps to discover the truth about his past, sort of like Leonard Shelby from Memento. Lenny! Filling in the role of the director from the first game, the voice in your ear, as it were, is Leo Casper. Leo is seen helping Danny escape from the asylum, and from that point on, he then cheers you on or chides you as you play. There are also specific levels in the game where the player takes control of Leo, which ironically are the stages where Leo has full control over Danny. You see, if you haven't figured it out already, Leo and Danny are the same person. More specifically, Daniel Lamb was a research scientist for the government-funded Pikmin project with the goal of developing a device that could implant a completely separate personality into the user's brain. In this case, the Pikmin project sought to implant the personality of a trained assassin that could be activated and then switched off completely after carrying out a job, with the host completely unaware. With the project close to losing funding, Daniel volunteers himself to receive the Pikmin bridge, confident in the safety of the device and desperate to pay off his family's debts after proof of concept is achieved. The bridge unexpectedly malfunctions, causing Daniel to experience an extreme case of dissociative identity disorder, wherein the implanted personality of Leo becomes self-aware and begins to manipulate and control Danny over the course of several years. Daniel is shown as a family man and a remorseful, reluctant killer who only does so to find out what's going on and then continues to do so because the people in his way are evil scum that will actively hurt him, something Leo is keen to remind him of as you butcher your way across each level. In an attempt to completely break Danny's will and take full control of his mind, Leo manipulates Danny into going on a killing spree against former members of the project that would have knowledge of the bridge, setting fire to their old paper records, and finally works his way back to Daniel's home where he butchers his own wife in front of their son. The cutscene with this reveal doesn't show the graphic details, 
but the audio, combined with Daniel's reaction to watching the footage, is grim and effective. Gustavo, you're not a rainbow player, man. Go back to Call of Duty. One thing that makes this plot solid and chilling is that it was heavily influenced by the very real MK Ultra, a shocking, disgusting, illegal 20-year experiment that consisted of various methods, such as use of chemical compounds, brainwashing, and cruel psychological torture to try to force confession from a captive or to impel them to defect to our side. MKUltra was preceded by similar horrific experiments carried out by Nazi scientists at death camps like Auschwitz and Dachau, as they used various drug combinations to measure their effects in an attempt to generate a so-called truth serum. It's been speculated that MKUltra was just continuing this work, supported even more so with the cold historical reality of Operation Paperclip a U.S. intelligence program that hired over 1,500 German scientists, engineers, and technicians, many of whom were former Nazis. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and please don't forget to vote! Are the project behind this, too? They're behind everything, Danny. TVMK. I watch that channel all the time. Exactly. I think the first time I played Manhunt 2, I just sort of didn't pay attention to the story. Figuring out the big twist early on, combined with the knowledge that the version of the game I was playing was muzzled, I guess I must have just checked out. But playing it now, I really appreciate it quite a bit more. I've read over the years how people have compared it to Fight Club, and yeah, maybe a little bit, especially given Rockstar's propensity to ape films. For example, in this scene, showing Daniel being conditioned by the project, it's taken almost shot for shot from the recruitment test scene from the parallax view, which of course was more or less cribbed from the Ludovico technique from A Clockwork Orange. But dissociative identity disorder existed way before Tyler Durden, and I thought it was a great touch where the project lead, Dr. Pickman, realizes he's being interrogated by Leo Casper, even though he sees Daniel's body in front of him, of course. Danny isn't here. Leo. Where's Daniel? I'd like to have a word with him. This is about what I want. I want you to remove the Pikmin Bridge. Throughout the game, Leo has his own distinct voice, raspy and evil. This is what Danny hears in his head. In this scene, it's clear that this is Daniel doing his Leo Casper voice, as others would have heard it when he's under control of the madman. We'll talk about some of the early story concepts a little later, but I have to say, overall, as fascinating conceptually as the final plot is, the actual implementation is kind of wonky. I could be wrong, but the plot has this cobbled together feel to it. Manhunt 2 was initially being developed by Rockstar Vienna, but after the studio closed in May of 2006, the product was shipped over to Rockstar London to be finished. It's known that the order of each level was rearranged quite a bit for the final game, and I have to wonder if this was to keep the plot somewhat coherent. As I say, I appreciate the story more than I did in my first playthrough, but some of it left me confounded, especially the ending. This is kind of where I said, huh? So after learning from Dr. White that Leo possessed him and made him murder his own wife, Daniel is told that in order to defeat Leo, he must go into a dark corner of his own mind, perform a series of executions on Leo himself, then defeat the ghosts of his past before burying his wife in a grave marked by a large squiggly project symbol. Okay? He then defeats Leo once and for all by beating him with a shovel conjured from his mind. 
this was all Danny could think of? Wouldn't you use your mind's powers to, like, have Leo abducted by aliens or stuffed into a building-sized junkyard crusher or something more extravagant? My name is Dan! Shoot, this would have been a prime opportunity to have a Pigsy cameo where he runs Leo through with his rusty chainsaw. Nope, a shovel. After this, Danny wakes up on a remote road, unaware of who he is. Again. Uh, uh, nah, he's not seeing me. There's an envelope with a note telling him that his name is David Joyner and that he lives at a local address. Off he wanders down the road, being afforded a second chance at life, unaware of his awful past. It's an odd ending because, if we put aside the shovel, Daniel Lamb was not a good person. He was a bioweapons researcher and one of the project leads for the Pikmin Bridge. He took the bridge unto himself and he ended up a psychopath that lost everything. Something his wife warned him about, by the way. Then there's the secret ending. Outstanding. So, if your style rating is high enough over several levels, you'll unlock the secret Leo ending. In the alternate ending, Danny attempts to lock Leo up in a poorly guarded prison cell deep in his mind. Good plan. Leo easily escapes and goes on a tear. This is basically a generic third-person shooter level that culminates with a battle in a room reminiscent of the one that James Earl Cash defeated the director in at the end of the first Manhunt. Leo squashes Danny and takes full control over his body. When he wakes up, Dr. White explains that he's been out for three weeks, and in that time, she made the choice to remove the Pikmin Bridge. Wait, 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 wait. So let me get this straight. The bridge malfunctioned, causing Leo, an ice-cold assassin, to become self-aware, who then led his host, Danny, on a six-week killing spree against members of the project. They finally capture Danny after he takes his wife out. They erase his memory, burn his house down, only to then send him to an asylum where they attempt to fix this bridge. It didn't work again. He escaped again and went back to killing alongside his imaginary friend. Again! Danny is then captured again. Again! Via sedative on the set of Five Past High Noon. And instead of immediately removing the bridge at that point, the dumbass Dr. White just tells Danny to defeat Leo in his mind. There is no God. You know something? Leo deserves to win, and the remaining project members deserve their fate. And I'm an emotional sap. I like happy endings. But this is absolutely the better ending of the two. Ah! <sighs> but anyway... I still love the concept. As I interpret it, the immoderate plot about Daniel Lamb being implanted with the personality of a serial killer is just window dressing for the overarching meta-narrative about people being conditioned by everything they watch, hear, and read. Much like how the first Manhunt gave us a stark, confrontational look inside of ourselves for voyeuristically enjoying sadism, Manhunt 2 suggests that any one of the masses could be acclimatized to being a hostile, violent savage given the proper stimulus. And to think, Manhunt 2 came out right before the explosion of smartphones and social media. Do what they trained us to do. We're gonna kill them. <laughs> To put it simply, Manhunt 2 plays like the first game, with a few steps forward and a few steps back. I like the cleaner UI compared to the first game. No stamina meter or character icons this time. As in the first game, the basic gameplay loop of Manhunt 2 is stalking enemies from the shadows, creating distractions, and executing them when the time is right. Holding the action button down for longer extends the targeting reticle from white to yellow to red. As with Manhunt 1, the longer you hold, the more brutal the execution. Hand-to-hand -hand combat and melee brawls are slightly improved from the first game, but that's not really saying much. The combat in game 1 was manageable, 
but it was gimped on purpose as brawling enemies wasn't the point. Large blunt weapons like sledgehammers can drop enemies pretty quickly, but melee combat is still clearly not the focus. The other problem is that if you get hit, you get staggered significantly, opening you up to further strikes and eventually you can be knocked down into the fetal position. Theoretically, it's interesting to see the main character being on the receiving end if you mess up, but in practice, it's just annoying to get smacked around like a helpless pool noodle. But don't worry. Manhunt 2 gets rid of the balance between predator and helpless victim as soon as guns are introduced, which happens much, much earlier than they did in the first game. The mechanics aren't awful per se, but the gunplay is just standard third person shooter fare with a series of gory exclamation points per headshot. It's not the shooting itself that bugs me, it's the fact that the vast majority of Manhunt 2 is shooting, and it's all piss easy. I never once felt threatened by any opponent with any weapon ever. And again, there's just way too much of it. The first game had a few levels like the mall and the chemical factory where cash was required to battle with guns, but the difference is that the enemies with firearms were lethal in the first game. In Manhunt 2, even in levels where stealth is viable, it's so much easier to just blast through. I'd be more inclined to pursue the challenge of the hunt, but then you have to contend with the erratic, spotty AI. Lurking in the shadows and waiting to strike is still the cornerstone of Manhunt 2's gameplay, but this is where things fall apart. AI pathfinding is often shaky, with characters getting stuck in loops or just spinning around on a dime when you're attempting to strike. I tried tinkering with the frame rate to see if that had any effect, but nope. Sometimes enemies won't react to your sound, which is disappointing as this is a pretty important mechanic in any stealth game. And look at this. I sniped his buddy. Eh, almost cared. I wing his shoulder. Eh, close to interested. Well, now he's missing his dome, so, okay. Sometimes it takes a hunter a long, long time to walk away from investigating your position, which slows the pace of the game to a grinding halt. Just walk away, and there will be an end to the horror. Then, Sometimes, when they turn around after you go to strike, the enemy will walk away super fast and your execution is foiled. Well, see you later. Speaking of which, the game introduces another concept that had a lot of potential, custom executions. In the garage level, Leo can carry around a jerry can, pour his own puddle of gas, and ignite a hunter when he investigates it. I thought this concept would be expanded as the game progressed, but nope, this is it. Think of the potential of setting up traps and lures, etc. Ah, <sighs> another squandered opportunity. And speaking of wasted possibilities, something I wish Manhunt 2 had included were bigger, badder special characters like Ramirez or Pigsy. I know the battle against Ramirez was simple, but the apartment complex set piece was awesome, as is the legendary battle against Pigsy. Even the unnamed leader of Cerberus, the director's personal bodyguard, had a really cool set-piece fight in Starkweather's mansion. I mean, you sort of have a boss fight against Michael, Daniel's best friend, but it's extremely easy. And in the end, you're just chasing a nerd in a salmon polo wielding a flare gun. What are you looking at, nerd? Huh? Where are you, sweet cheeks? Why are you gay? Rockstar tried to implement some extra tension when Danny is hiding in the shadows with this breath-holding minigame where you have to keep this dot held inside of this circle for a short while. I do appreciate the effort to try to mix things up, but this minigame sucks and I never failed it once. It just slowed the game down. 
as do the quick time events during executions, where you move your mouse in the indicated direction to mimic the movement. This is abysmal, and I turned them off before I even started recording footage. That's all you need to know about that. Do them if you like, I guess. Danny can also smash out some of the lights in the environment, but it's kind of a limited feature. Shaping the environment to your will with Garrett's water arrows or Sam Fisher's pistol is incredible. This isn't that. Motion sensing lights got added too, but they're underutilized and really only act to trigger civilian AI in the suburbs to come out and attack Leo. If I had to sum up the gameplay of Manhunt 2 in one word, it would be almost. So many interesting concepts came off as imprudently introduced and never fully realized. It was almost good. If the gun combat had been scaled back, the AI code smoothed out a little more, and the new concepts like portable environmental executions had been expanded upon, this could have been an excellent sequel that the first Manhunt truly deserved. Damn son of a bitch! Okay, so clearly Manhunt 2 isn't flawless, but one thing Rockstar games have always excelled at is sound design. Well, almost always. As much as I appreciate the plot, I have to admit that I cannot stand Leo Casper as a character. Again, great concept, but some of the performances are hokey and lame. Leo, who interestingly enough was voiced by the baseball kid from Maximum Overdrive, is the ultimate edgelord. Listen, it's a manhunt. Oh brother, this guy stinks! And the written dialogue is often terrible. He's a nurse. He'll help me. This is insane. Go on, try it. See how it feels to own a life. We've got to check out that safe house. Don't trust that whore. She wanted to help. Wanted to I thought I was cold and unfeeling. Whoa! You gave me the boy, I give you the man! Yeah! Revenge is sweet! <laughs> oh, brother! With respect to Holter Graham, a concept like Leo Casper could have done much better with a different actor and some less edgy lines. Lionel Starkweather, the wicked director from the first Manhunt, said some truly greasy, evil things to James Earl Cash. But because the dialogue was perfectly written for this ultra creep, and because actor Brian Cox brought an a performance, it never really came off as trying too hard. Although it could have been much, much different. You see, there was a lot of altered or cut content for Manhunt 2. The most interesting is the very earliest concepts of who or what Danny Lamb and his sidekick were going to be. In this early user interface test footage mockup created by Steve Walsh from Rockstar North, you can see the menu looking quite a bit different, and yes, that's a puppet. You see, in the PSP 0.01 version of Manhunt 2, exists a model and a texture sheet that some capable fans have assembled into this. This is Frisbee the Puppet, the original Leo Casper of the game, said to have commanded the main protagonist to do his bidding. Yep, this is a real thing that had at least one rendition before being scrapped. I can only imagine what this concept would have been if fleshed out, or clothed out, or whatever. I wondered what his voice would have sounded like. As I say, the altered content of Manhunt 2 is very bizarre and fascinating. That's nothing to say of the other concept that the team had, which apparently was the lead character hearing the voice of God commanding him to kill. Look, 
I'd rather Rockstar had continued with the illegal film ring and the Mr. Nasty plotline, but I'll take Danny and Leo over the voice of a deity any day. That sounds terrible. Anyway, the rest of the cast does a fine enough job. Daniel Lamb is voiced by Ptolemy Slocum, and he has the appropriate vocal intonation for this nerdy researcher turned frantic amnesiac. Some of the lines are pretty cheesy, but it's a decent performance nonetheless. The remainder of the sound design is solid, though, in my opinion, a step down from the first game. Executions have the usual incredible foley work to mimic slashing, strangling, gurgling, and splattering, enough to make the most desensitized wince. Job well done. The music is a bit of a mixed bag. Craig Connor returns to helm the soundtrack. As I mentioned in my review of the first Manhunt, I think Craig is a brilliant musician and has a long list of major contributions to various Rockstar titles. That said, Manhunt 2's soundtrack is pretty nondescript. Georgie boy, come on in. Jeez, you look like shit. The original game has some of my favorite music ever put to a video game. Incredibly eerie, atmospheric, memorable, and at times, quite catchy. Manhunt 2 puts the music further in the background, with more industrial noises and subtle string arrangements that are meant to instill dread. But frankly, they're all forgettable. Well, all except one. This brutal, evil track that thunders out in the fetish dungeon is another thing I distinctly remember from my original playthrough of this game. It's that good. It has this vile, immoral ring to it that burrows into your mind and is nearly hypnotic which, as it turns out, was kind of the point. The Sado Masso Club is a recruitment center for potential Pikmin subjects. While watching Danny become conditioned in the Pikmin Project Auditorium, you hear a more subdued version of this same song, suggesting that this is the project's hypnosis tune, explaining why it plays in the fetish dungeon. The song aids the project in brainwashing its subjects, helping to dredge up and condition one's cruel side. It's an excellent use of music in an otherwise unmemorable soundtrack. And on the topic of mixed bags, So right up front, even back when it released, Manhunt 2 looked pretty rough. There is something charming about the titles late in the renderware engine's life cycle, the Warriors being a personal favorite of mine, but by late 2007, this was honestly disappointing. Evidently, the game was supposed to look much, much better. A post from an unknown designer from Rockstar London states that the game had to be downgraded on all platforms in order to meet the specifications of the PSP. It would have been cool to see the fully realized version, but whatever. The biggest disappointment to me isn't the shaders, textures, polygon counts, etc. Let's talk about the levels and the hunters that patrol them. The first is the Asylum. I like this setting well enough, it's the sort of classic creepy asylum where the staff are just as violent as the patients. It kind of reminds me of House on Haunted Hill. Pretty simple, but it sets the tone right away, as the first few characters will urinate on Danny and or fling their dung at him. Another inmate has sought a permanent solution for his problems. It's harsh. And the level is a great set piece tutorial as the two sides clash with Danny centered in the quarrel. The orderly inmate designs are nothing special, but make for solid introductory fodder. The watchdogs are a hit squad for the project. These hunters are boring, faceless goons in suits with various creative wrestler accessories. They're generic and they say generic things. Yeah, that's it? 
The charred haunted house, later revealed to be Danny's old home where he axed his missus, is pretty cool. It's dilapidated and spooky with plenty of ghostly images and flashbacks. The pervs are easily the best group of hunters in the entire game, which is to say they're grotesque, amoral, reprehensible filth, and a pleasure to snuff out. They're visually distinct and very memorable. Rockstar really cranked up the sleaze factor with this gang. The exotic dance club front is creepy and uncomfortable enough, but the fetish dungeon down below is where the real nasty stuff happens. This area is very clearly inspired by the film Hostel, with some hunter designs being near total ripoffs. Nevertheless, this group and this level are the peak of Manhunt 2's design, and I genuinely felt a sense of hollow victory after wiping them out. Like, yeah, I won, but the filth won't wash off from the experience. It's effective art. Red Light is a solid level. This area really gives off the strongest New Orleans influences that the fictional town of Cottonmouth was based around. The Creole-style architecture fits perfectly with the seedy red neon and adult variety stores inhabited by the ugliest types of people. Unfortunately, the Red King's Hunter Faction is another boring, almost their group. After such a shocking introduction, the potential for a terrifying Creole thug group was completely squandered thereafter. He has the key to the boat. It's our only way out of here. The Sugar Factory visually is about as fun as trimming the small hairs on my little brown sand dollar. But then we meet the Project Militia, quite possibly the most boring enemy faction in any game ever. Generic military style thugs with boring OD green webbing, boonie hats, and combat boots. Things get more interesting again with the shootout in a rundown, crusty adult movie theater. The thunderous clap of firearms and screams echoing over the ludicrous audio backdrop of a man and a woman slapping meat is darkly humorous and completely over the top. Everything Manhunt should be. Bee's Honey Pot, a sordid brothel managed by a sleazy creep, is another highlight. It's in line with the unsavory atmosphere established well thus far, which is great, but who are these random lunatics patrolling the hull? Yeah, yeah, I know. It's the project, Danny, and blah, blah, blah. Ah, but they're just generic hick white guys with mustaches. The Bloodhound Gang. No, but you know something? That would have been amazing. An angry group of people in monkey costumes trying to whack you. Wait. Anyway, nope. Just another group of angry white guys with eye-rolling, ham-fisted political quips. More wasted potential. The Sinister Underground Project Lab is pretty nifty with the Pikmin monkeys and the battle through the morgue as Danny has to shoot out speakers, bellowing out a command that will disable him. The TV studio is another almost winner with various sets, sound booths, and a shootout punctuated with cheers from a non-existent audience. It's a shame that the Hunter Gang is the lame bloodhounds again. This was an ideal spot to bring back something ridiculous, like the cam heads, a concept gang from the first game. I know it might sound ridiculous, but think. It's at this point in the story that Daniel's mental stability is on the very fritz, and being attacked by a gang of camera-headed wackos in a TV studio where you hear an imaginary audience would have been mint. What are you gonna do, Danny? What are you gonna do? Plus, the TV studio has a little animated short. This little short film is great, and reminds me a little bit of the various miniseries from Max Payne. It would have been cool to see the whole story play out over the course of the game, perhaps reflecting Daniel's journey, but alas. 
blood. God lies, kids. Nature will kill. It's a ranch where sinners don't expect forgiveness. I like how the TV studio spills out into a full-blown set for five past high noon, replete with the Wild West staples like the church, barn, and the windmill. It's also mildly interesting to note that this was before the first Red Dead Redemption came out. Late in the game, we have the level set in the suburbs of Wooddale. This is where Leo takes over and runs amok, making his way to Daniel's home where he puts an end to his marriage. This level had great, great potential. It's pretty solid as is. I really love the frightening concept of this cruel, unforgiving killer running through quaint suburban streets as he's hunted by the police. But again, this is a case of wasted potential. I'm not saying they should go too extreme, but slipping through unsuspecting homes to evade law enforcement and being put in chilling situations that show how ruthless this character could be would have been interesting. As a matter of fact, the pre-beta version sounded more interesting. The level initially took place earlier in the game and saw Danny track down and eliminate project team members in their own homes, which were noted by red mailboxes outside. The final release is just Leo running through the streets while dodging the most generic looking police character models ever. And that's it. You can actually beat this level without killing a single person. We already discussed Weary Pine Cemetery and the alternate ending, and it's nothing too outrageous to speak of. So all in all, the levels and the hunter factions of Manhunt 2 are big time hit or miss. In the end, there's just so much wasted potential, and I know I keep saying that, but it's just such a shame. One last thing in reference to the visuals, the sheer amount of animations for executions. As you can see by this footage of the original PS2 release, Rockstar put this absolutely atrocious filter over the screen. This fuzzy, red-gray obstruction hid away enough of the violence to satisfy the board. I remember this so clearly when I played the game in 07, and I tried to justify it. I tried to say, oh well, it looks more psychotic like this, or that, well, this is what Daniel would see, or something, but ah, bullshit. This just looks terrible. Well, here's a comparison of a few side by side. <laughs> many, many more. The uncut PC version adds in even more weapons and more executions, including additional firearm executions. Oh yeah, they added those. Some of them are truly vicious and hardcore, and without the crazy blurred filter or even the default reddish filter of the PC version, they can be truly gruesome. The thing is, there's also the signature dark humor that Rockstar Games does so well. Some of the brutality is just plain silly, like compacting a man into a sugar cube. Aside from the splatter, this is straight out of a Wile E. Coyote cartoon. But was there anything worthy of the international mass banning that Manhunt 2 was subjected to? Well, no, of course not. In 2007 alone, films like Hostel Part 2 were released, one of the most graphic American horror films I've ever watched. Hannibal Rising also came out that year, as did Rob Zombie's Halloween 2, another film that was nothing more than repeated bouts of vicious, brutal, senseless violence, not to mention one of the worst scripts ever written. Die! Although it did have Malcolm McDowell with a mustache, so, you know. 
Anyway, you can see my point. I don't have a vicarious desire to watch brutality in gaming. I've seen enough horrifying stabbings with some unmentionable statistics coming from the UK, and enough CCTV shootings on my side of the world. My total life bloodlust is a cup that runneth over again and again. But Manhunt 2 is a game. It's fake. It's not real. And I can separate the two. If a piece of art has been carefully crafted by multiple talented people for an audience to enjoy, only to then have their work smeared over while talentless hacks run free making whatever they want, it's a bit of an insult. Alright, look, no more sermons, okay? Is Manhunt 2 a good video game or not? I don't know. I'm conflicted. Is it as good as the first Manhunt? <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. The first game was clearly a project of passion, crafted by a team of young, rebellious hearts and minds out to craft something wholly unique. They believed in it. Game development seems to be incredibly challenging, and there are many moving parts to these projects, so with respect to all involved, Manhunt 2 kinda has the stink of a project that got sent out to a B team and was barely being kept together before the workload got moved on to another studio, who then did everything they could to polish it before launch. It's absolutely not a bad game at all. Quite frankly, I enjoyed it much more than I did 16 plus years ago especially the uncut PC port, which is out there if you search hard enough. If you were a fan of the first title, it's definitely worth seeking out. It's very short and it's easy, so it's not a big time sink and I never felt even close to rage quitting or anything like that. It's just such a shame that the game wasn't given the attention and the time that it deserved. When it shines, it feels like a proper manhunt game, but these moments are fleeting. One last question I see posted online constantly, should there be a manhunt 3? Yes, there should be a manhunt 3. My concept is simple, social media, GoPros, the dark web, and the return of Mr. Nasty or do a Pigsy prequel set in the late 80s or early 90s. Rockstar has more money than the Vatican, so why not? But it's never going to happen. What happened? Did your, did your balls drop off? Huh? The sooner we come to terms with that, the sooner we can all move on together. And besides, take comfort in the fact that we already have Manhunt 3 at home. Dumb bitch. Sure. No. <laughs>